Welcome to today's Q&A podcast, live, streaming, whatever you want to call it. Open the window a little bit so we get some sunlight in here. Uh, how is everybody? By the way, welcome Jay. Jay, you were the first one. Jay, I think we kind of need some microphones for this so the audio quality could be a little bit better. What do you think? Um, that's my question for, for Jay as to start this off. Anybody, feel free to ask questions. Text at text me at 203-590-8607. Got a couple of questions to uh, respond to. But first, how was your July 4th? Where did you do fireworks along the thousands and thousands of illegal fireworks off of every city? Did you know, did you see this weekend, there was something like 115 separate cases of shootings in New York City and there was like a ton of deaths. So something is not working out. Something yeah. is not going well. And, uh, and it's not gonna end. Where are the police? There is no police anymore. No. What, what police, what police? Uh, that's, you know, here's the thing. When you, have, when you have three months, do you remember when, like for everybody listening, do you remember when you started college and it's your first time away from your parents' home and you had all this free time because you didn't have classes, you didn't have to get the school bus at 7.30 a.m., maybe your first class was at 2 p.m., maybe some days you didn't have a class, and you had all this extra free time. What was the first thing you did? You got into these incredibly stressful, yeah. semi-romantic relationships, and then suddenly everyone, it's your first experience, everyone's cheating on everyone else, and everyone's gossiping, and everyone is angst-ridden, and imagine now three months of that, okay, where there's just nothing but free time, mm -hmm. and then put on top of that the stress of pandemic, and then the stress of all the protests, mm -hmm. and then by the way, China just announced there's the bubonic plague is returning. <laughs> Let's just keep the, we, obviously, right, it's, it should be clear to everyone by now that we are in the middle of a gigantic simulation game and it's gonna be over soon. We might have another year of it left, and then we're all just gonna wake up and we're gonna realize we're these lizard-like creatures and we all survived the best game ever. And we're gonna to wanna to go back in. Like, oh, the game's over already? This but we're gonna miss it. We're gonna miss Kanye West running for president. I listened to Kanye West music all day yesterday because why shouldn't he run for president? I mean, <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at Kanye West, Every, and, and by the way, I tweeted, oh, here's 10 lessons from Kanye West. And a lot of people were upset. Don't be upset over a tweet. Like I, I watched, Nell, so Nell Scovell, who's been on my podcast, she wrote a book about writing, she used to write for the David Letterman show, she wrote a book about it. And she was even tweeting, we've gotta boycott The Gap. The Gap did a deal with Kanye West. We can't encourage this. What are, what are they worried about? Kanye, they are, is anybody actually worried Kanye West is going to be president of the United States? And if he is, is that so much worse than right now? Or what would happen if someone with Alzheimer's became president? There's really no good presidential solution. And you know, but let, forget about him running for president for a second. Just for a moment, he is a, he is a person worth, worth studying. He was a producer. He wanted to be a rapper. Everyone said, you can't be a rapper. Even his closest friend, his closest colleague, Jay-Z, said, Kanye, stick to being a producer. Stick to your day job. Mm -hmm. You can't be a rapper. He was a rapper, and and once, once he was a rapper, he didn't just repeat the gangster rap styles of everyone else, because he wasn't a gangster. He grew up in a middle-class neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So he combined gospel, orchestra, children's choirs, chain gang chants, rap, his own particular production style, and he started making hit after hit after hit. He's, uh, I think he's the third best-selling uh, rapper of all time, the seventh best-selling mm -hmm. digital artist of all time with 150 million albums sold. So, okay, then he wanted to get into fashion. Everyone wrote articles, huge articles. Kanye, stick to your day job, you're horrible at fashion. Mm -hmm. Last year alone, he sold $1.3 billion worth of shoes. Mm -hmm. He announced a deal with The Gap and the stock went up a billion dollars mm -hmm. in seconds. So clearly, he's a he's smart- He's a very intelligent person. 
He, kn- he speaks Mandarin. He used to live in China. Yeah, he used to live you know, in China. As a, as a child, sort of like, you know, our kids. He half grew up in China, just like, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the guy has has got some depth. People just don't know. You know, they just think he's just this, you know, rapper that all he does is music. And they think he's a little bit crazy. But so what? Everyone's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, he has some mental <laughs> illness. But, okay, Joe Biden also has some mental illness. Donald Trump clearly has some mental illness. I don't know. I, I think Barack Obama was probably the most sane president we've had. I'm not saying that's good or bad politically, but in terms of like mental illness, probably he did not have. But like John F. Kennedy was some sort of, you know, sex addict. He was constantly cheating on Jackie. LBJ was a complete psychopath. Did you know LBJ would have meetings while in the bathroom? So he'd be shitting while having <coughs> meetings with all his aides in the bathroom. Nixon clearly had some mental illness, like he was in- addicted to lying and then ultimately he had to resign. Gerald Ford was sane. Jimmy Carter was sane, but a little bit weak. Reagan had Alzheimer's, we now know. Uh, know. You know, Fr- Franklin D. Roosevelt, I don't know if he had a mental illness, but he was sick throughout his entire preg- preg- uh, pregnancy, presidency. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. Calvin Coolidge probably did not have a mental illness, but he was very shy. Mm. Did I tell the story on here? So Calvin Coolidge was the president through the Roaring Twenties. Every day, his only job, he would get down to his office and he would figure out budget items to eliminate. And that created, you know, money ends up in only two places. It either ends up in private hands, like an individual's hands, or it ends up in the government. And so Calvin Coolidge, the more he would eliminate from the budget, the more money would end up in private hands, and that created the Roaring Twenties. But Calvin Coolidge, uh, he's president from 1922, I think, to 1929. Uh, He he was the vice president under Warren Harding, who died in office, believed to be poisoned by his wife because he was cheating on her. So another mentally ill guy. So Calvin Coolidge uh, never spoke. And so one time... uh, his son brought a friend home from college to the White House. They're having dinner at the White House. And the, the friend said to President Coolidge, Sir, I bet your son that you would say more than two words at dinner. And President Coolidge looked at him and said, You lose. And those were the only <laughs> words he said through the dinner, and the son won I the bet. It. I love it. By the way, 2020, once again, did, could it get even worse? We had bubonic plague found in China the other day. Well, well now also, uh, because of Hong Kong, because of China, they're, you know, remember that, that you showed me where they were able to take from people from other countries if they say anything negative. Oh yeah, so Ch- if you now say anything bad about China's treatment of Hong Kong, you're officially breaking... Or China. Up. Or, or China. Or China. No, specifically related to China's yeah. treatment of Hong Kong, that's against a law in China. And so you have to watch out for all the countries that have extradition treaties yeah. with China. Well, it's the extradition treaties with Hong Kong. See, they're the old ones. Ah. Because now that China has control of Hong Kong, now they're putting, they're adding this little caveat to that, so, which is really scary. Because like, when it was just Hong Kong, that was one thing, right? Because everyone has that. Yeah. But now that China is in control. Right. So France, Italy, and Spain, for instance, uh-huh. have extradition treaties with Hong Kong, which means they have extradition treaties along with a whole bunch of other countries with China, right? But I'm thinking, and London or England, England and does? Canada, but now Canada reversed it, and I, I think England is because now China is also uh, they are threatening England right now. They did it last night. They were threatening them. If you do this, I'm telling it's you, crazy. we're in a simulation. Yeah. So, so basically, you're saying. Because you have constantly trashed China on these Instagram lives. I can't travel. If you go to England, China can say, we want to extradite Robin, and they're going to have to at least take you to trial there in England. You're going to be detained. Right. No traveling for us. We can't. Can we go back to the Netherlands? I like doing comedy there. Uh, I think we can. I'm not sure. I had to look at the list, but there's a long list. A long list. It'll all change, though. I mean. So listen up. If you're God... And you're on this if you're on this Instagram live Q and A. Here's what you do: go to the computer that's marked 2020, pull out the plug, count for 15 seconds, put the plug back in. 
restart the computer. Maybe we need a reboot on 2020. It's getting them to be a little bit too much. Because then there was bubonic plague, then there's... Swine flu is around. Uh, swine flu, uh, Kanye West running for president. Um, by the way, um, some good news, and then I'll start answering some questions. But some, some good news. First off, cases yesterday, new coronavirus cases in the United States are at a high. Uh, daily new cases yesterday was 44,000. But here's the thing. We keep saying cases do not matter. The headlines are manipulating you to think whatever you want or whatever they want you to think. Daily new deaths in the US, I haven't even told you this. This is the chart for daily new deaths. I'm looking at it right now at World of Meters, which is where we always got our data. Mm -hmm. Daily new deaths yesterday was the lowest it's been in the United States since March 23rd. So daily new deaths were 209, 211, and uh, that's the lowest it's been since March 23rd. And yes, every death's serious, but there's 315 million people in this country Yes, there were 211 new deaths. This is a horrible virus. Plus, we've Nobody been after rioting. Get... We've had, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, people gathering together. There were more deaths from shootings in New York City mm -hmm. yesterday than coronavirus, which is particularly sad because New York City had just broken the record of simultaneous days of no murders, and now every day now there's murders in New York City. Uh, New York City, the latest data came out, I think it was on Friday, real estate housing is now 30% down to buy a home. Now, that, that's a real 30% decline. Like People mm. are desperate to get out of New York City, and it's happening at every price level. Right. I mean, it could turn into another autonomous zone. New York City? <laughs> Who knows? You never know if there's no policing if there's no you know no rules i do think i do think and i've had a bunch of conversations with people who've said the same thing i don't know how it's going to work out but i do think that, that the u.s is going to divide up into more than one country and we'll have kind of a common army but i think i think basically the blue and the red states hate each other mm -hmm. and texas hates everyone else i think you're going to see anyway so yeah i think there's going to be i think by 2007 you could uh, 2027 you could see three different mm -hmm. kind of not countries but like confederacies you know yeah. where there's like they're a like common the navy EU. Yeah. yeah maybe but there's no common army or navy for the eu it's not eu is not really a country no. yeah right, right you need you know oh victoria agrees with me thank you victoria um or at least another party i want to talk about a couple other parties business idea of the day and uh somebody says no no we don't well who knows? Who knows? Uh, oh, I want to talk about kind of the, the BS headlines of the day. There were several. So I read there, there's this big uh, cybersecurity conference that's happening. And it's, a, it's a, a conference for people interested in what's called black hat hacking. So it's hacking uh, illegally, but it's always mm -hmm. worth studying. You want to study the good and the bad in hacking. So it's a conference about black hat hacking techniques. Mm -hmm. And they want to change the name of the, of the conference because they think black hat might be racist. And the word black hat comes from, you know, old Western movies where the cowboys wearing black hats were kind of the bad guys and the cowboys wearing the white hats were kind of, you can't, you can't cancel everything with the word black in it. Okay. We're just, I don't, you, if one, by the way, good rule of thumb, when you cancel everyone, you've canceled nobody. So you can't cancel everything with the word black in it. Black hats have nothing to do with racism. It has to do with, historically, these cowboys, and it has to do with cybersecurity now. It has nothing to do with race. But you know what? Let them cancel it. Again, once they start canceling everything, they cancel nothing. And that's the end of cancel culture. So here's the other thing. I mean, really, even with the Bible, it's like that. You know, they were saying like Satan. Is, Satan is the, you know, the darkness. Um, you know, Jesus is the light. I mean, so there's a contrast. This has always been like a contrast, and that it, yeah. it had nothing to do with anyone's skin color. Right. Yeah. Was it's the like devil nighttime? Was daylight? I mean, well, it's just, Jesus. It's just how come they always make Jesus white in all the paintings? Well, he was not white. I don't. I don't know. Maybe that's just their 
Well, it's because white people, Europeans, uh, yeah, came to the painting. but I mean, he wasn't. He was an Arab. Or he was Semitic. He was me. Mm -hmm. So, an Arab, which you guys were brothers. Semitic, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I guess it was um, Jacob in the Bible, right? Ishmael, oh no, no, it was, it's it's, it was Israel. Or, uh, sorry, it was uh, Abraham in the Bi in the Bible. Right. His two children were Isaac, and which Ishmael. is the Jews, yep. and Ishmael, which is the mm -hmm. Arabs. So, another headline. I have never heard of this school, but in Virginia, there's a college called Emory and Henry College, and they're going to change their school mascot. You know why? Their school mascot is the wasp, and they fit the, the you know like a hornet, but the, the wasp, mm -hmm. and the they 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 want to change their mascot because it is indicative, they say, of the acronym WASP, oh, okay. which is a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and so they're going to change Are their they name. Change the name of the wasp too. Uh, yeah, maybe they need to change the name of the insect. So that was that's another BS headline of the day. Well, and I don't even have a good headline of the day. The good headline of the day is that there's actually good coronavirus news. No matter what people say, just just you know, I know everybody turns on the news or goes to CNN.com or Fox News or MSNBC. No matter what anybody says about coronavirus cases surge, there's no vaccine, there's no immunity. The re here, let's just look at what we know is the reality. Deaths now per day are the lowest since the, vi the lockdowns began. So since March 23rd, that's really good news. Um, and look, I'm saying this as someone whose cousin, first cousin is on a ventilator right now in Florida, knocking on wood, he gets better. It looks like he's getting a little better, but he's been on a ventilator for over a week, which is serious. But, you know, this is a serious virus. Nobody wants to get it. But 215 deaths yesterday. And of course, once again, most of the deaths are either people in nursing homes or people with, you know, who are over 80. So yes, take all precautions. I'll tell you personally what precautions we take. So we take all the vitamins you could possibly take. We stay healthy. We go out in the sun. If you go out in the sun around 1 p.m., uh, that's when the most vitamin D is around. Go outside for just 10 minutes and you'll get enough vitamin D. I, I, we don't take hydroxychloroquine, but I do take quercetin, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. I'm not recommending it, but if you Google quercetin and cor coronavirus, you could do your own research. I take quercetin with zinc. Quercetin has some similarities with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So that's why I take it. Uh, and then we take a bunch of other supplements. And I, I I, we don't use any uh, sunscreen because then that blocks the vitamin D. Yeah, so it's good just to go. You out. look tan though. I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's because it's the ten minutes a day. I I, I never I never get tan. Uh, and oh oh here's another one. Saint Louis wants to change their name because Louis the Fourteenth, who was a king in France in like mm -hmm. the Neanderthal age, was anti-Semitic. He burned some Jewish. Uh, editions of uh, the Jew Jewish holy text, the Talmud. And I can guarantee you, as a Jew, mm -hmm. and someone who knows many Jewish people, nobody gives a shit what Saint, that St. Louis is called St. Louis. We do not care. So, um, you know, it's not as if... And look, I saw someone say, someone asked a reasonable question. If we take down all the statues, will we forget the examples of history? And this is on the other side of this. Like, I don't think, like, why do we ever put up a statue for Robert E. Lee, a guy who waged war and killed American soldiers? But whatever. But I will say, it's not as if we need statues of Hitler in order to remember Germany. Like, in egregious cases, there's no reason to have to memorialize, right. you know, evil. But St. Louis, who cares? And the, the Wasp, who cares? Or black hats versus white hats in cybersecurity. Who cares? Does not matter. So um, I'm going to talk about one business idea of the day, and then I'll answer some questions. Uh, here's something that's true. If you and I were going to get married, and let's say we we're going to hold a big wedding, mm -hmm. and let's say we wanted to do it right now, like mm -hmm. uh, have a July wedding, mm -hmm. what would we do? We wouldn't be able to invite old people. Mm -hmm. People aren't flying as much. And airline tickets are 96% down. Let's say you wanted to have a good old fashioned traditional wedding with yeah. 100 to 200 people. You wouldn't be able to do it. Would right. you wait? 
Probably not. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I no, no, but that's me. I mean, I, so I already had a big wedding, but these kids that are, you know, marrying for the first time, I guess they are waiting, but maybe they're going to wait for a long time or they just go to the beach and everyone's spread out and everyone has their masks and just do it a different way. Or yeah. you do it on Zoom. Yeah. So here's my idea of the day. Tell me what you think. Okay. You guys tell me what you think. So, uh, a Zoom wedding planner. Because people still want to get married and they still want to have that intimacy of seeing their friends and they still want to have toasts and they still want to have a, you know, have a dance with their partner mm -hmm. and, you know, they want everybody to come together and, and celebrate. Yeah. And yeah, sure, a beach wedding is good, but then people mm -hmm. have to fly. Mm -hmm. Nobody's flying. Sure. Like old people are not going to fly. You meet right. your grandparents and your, your bubby and your uncles mm -hmm. and your aunts mm -hmm. and, you know, the parents of your best friends growing up. and. Right. So no one's gonna fly. So Zoom wedding planner is 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 going to be a legit profession. Yeah. So because here's the thing too, what's the things that you normally get in a wedding? You get gifts. You take photographs. You put together a wedding album. Again, you have the camaraderie of all your friends making toasts, and you have you know dances and games. Yeah. So a Zoom wedding planner would still plan the schedule. By the way, the laws state by state are also mm -hmm. interesting. Because in some states, the priest or the judge or whatever has to be in the same room as you. And in other states, they don't. So in New York, they just changed the law so the officiator does not have to be in the same room as you, but some states do. So a Zoom wedding planner would plan first, would tell you the laws sure. state by state. And uh, uh, you know, so you know you're, you're actually getting married. Yeah. So then they would need to come up with the schedule. They would need to send out all the evites to people, inviting to them to Zoom, uh, keep track of the laws. Uh, maybe you want to send gifts to each guest. You know how, like you go to a wedding, there's gifts waiting for you at the hotel, or maybe you, or there's a bottle of wine at the table. Uh, so wine needs to go out to everybody. Maybe even meals need to go out, like or surprises, some kind of surprise, or something, you know, some kind of nice cards or letters. Uh, then, you know, at the wedding itself, there needs to be the ceremony and then you need to have kind of a, a Zoom photographer to take photographs or screenshots mm -hmm. or get other people to take photographs. When you send everybody, uh, here's really classic thing, send everybody like a Polaroid camera and then they have to kind of send you the Polaroids yeah. that they took that, and the wedding, the Zoom wedding planner would keep track of those and put them into the, mm -hmm. the album. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then do breakout rooms and that would kind of be like the tables and yeah. you have like fun things in the breakout rooms and then you need the re and then the wedding couple goes to each breakout room and says hello to everybody then you need a receiving line for the bride uh, so people have a breakout room where they could go visit the bride yeah. and chat with her or the groom mm -hmm. uh, uh, and again the photography planning the album so I think a zoom wedding planner this is not a ten million dollar idea but if you charge like somewhere between three and $5,000, and then as the service, mm -hmm. okay, instead of a wedding planner who charges thirty dollars or $40,000, and then you charge a 10%, um, you know, up to, uh, what is it, a 10% more uh, on everything you buy, like the bottles of wine and the, mm -hmm. you know, whatever else you send to all the guests, the nicely done invitations and so on, you can make a decent living and you hire people to work for you for a salary, but you're making, right. you know, so anyway, that is the That's idea really of the day. Yeah. Or you can just make hazmat suits and like tuxedo hazmat suits and you know formal ones and that way people can just come. People still have to fly. Wear their hazmat suits while they're flying. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, so that's something that's fun for everyone. Fun and for the whole fashion. family. Hazmat fashion. I'll tell you the idea. Even the idea that we need Zoom wedding planners makes me so much happy happier <laughs> I because I don't ever want to go to a wedding ever again. I've been to. I'm 52 years old. I've been to maybe two weddings in my life other than like my own weddings mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's it. So, so I'm so happy at the thought of, oh, another BS news of the day. Marvel Comics deleted an image of Captain America from their Twitter account because it was, it was wrong timing, they said. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. Okay, uh, uh, okay here's another uh, business idea of the day. Um, uh, you know, I talked about uh, setting up a coronavirus compliance business where you go from um, corporation to corporation that has multiple offices all over the world and how they, you know, get compliance and so on. 
I think you can make a smaller version of the same idea, but focus just on schools. So again, schools, state by state, there are different laws, mm -hmm. district by district, there are different laws, and depending on the medical needs of the children and the teachers, there are different situations, but how do you disinfect all the surf surfaces? Mm -hmm. How do you teach remotely? How do you maybe rotate kids? So like, here's the morning kids do these classes, here's the afternoon kids do these classes. Mm -hmm. You advise the district, what do you do with the morning kids when it's the afternoon and the parents can't pick them up yet? So mm -hmm. I think doing coronavirus consulting for schools is gonna be a critical, critical, that will be a billion dollar industry. If you do that business, you can create, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you can either do it for a living, it could be a, a uh, what's called a lifestyle uh, business, or you can do it as a real big business. Uh, uh, you know, education consulting. You know, for educational facilities for coronavirus compliance. Cor these issues are not going away. No one is. No one is going to be. There is no normal anymore. We're not going back to a normal. Even if every newspaper article says the coronavirus, we defeated it. It's gone. There's always going to be people who say, you know what, I'm not taking any chance, I'm going to stay home. I mean, I've seen the range of reactions from people. I, I know one f uh, father who, as soon as the lockdown started, he locked himself in a room. His wife and two kids have not seen him. They just leave the dishes for him because he's immunocompromised and he got very paranoid. And so we're seeing all sorts of like, his, his daughter snuck out of the house once to see her boyfriend and she got locked in her room for the next month and couldn't go to her graduation because as punishment. So everybody's going a little bit crazy. We're at our wits end. Shootings are happening all over the place. Kanye West is running for president, which is fine. I'm for it. Um, so I'm going to answer some questions and I'll also, if there's any questions here, Jay will keep track of them and, and he'll send me something or again, you could text me questions, Jay can put the phone number up. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, I've answered this already, but I'll answer it again because it comes up quite a bit. If the Federal Reserve is printing so much money, we're doing trillions of dollars in stimulus. If the Fed is printing all this money, is there, this person says that her father or her husband, um, says there's gonna be massive, massive hyperinflation, which means if something costs a dollar today, maybe next week it'll cost $10, and a week later it'll cost $100. So uh, I think upstairs I have a, a, a trillion dollar bill from Zimbabwe, because Zimbabwe had hyperinflation. Well, the good news is there is not gonna be hyper, hyperinflation. There's, there, right now there is massive deflation. Don't forget, I just said houses in New York City are 30% down. In Zimbabwe or in Germany in the 1920s, you had to bring a wheelbarrow of currency to the supermarket just to buy food. Now food, at the beginning of this pandemic, food prices were up because there was a supply shortage, but there's no supply shortage right now. There is no shortage at all. So prices of everything are down. Again, printing money doesn't cause hyperinflation. Let's just do economics lesson. You know, the, a do, the value of the dollar is like the value of anything else. It's a market, it's market driven. It's a function of supply and demand. So if you print more dollars, supply goes up. So it maybe it means the value of the dollar goes down, which means inflation goes up. When inflation goes up, the value of the dollar goes down. Instead of the dollar being worth a dollar, it's worth a penny. That's hyperinflation. But there is, yes, there is much more supply of dollars, but the demand for dollars is incredibly high. So the rest of the world doesn't trust their own money. They want dollars. So, so they will trade their euros for dollars. They will trade their yen for dollars. China, which is going crazy right now, all their wealthy Chinese people, correct me if I'm wrong, they, are, they love to have dollars, right? Like yeah. all, all your friends from China, they're, they're trading their yen for dollar or whatever it is, right. the renminbi mm -hmm. for dollars. So the US has a long way to go before there's hyperinflation. The key thing is, what has always helped the U.S.? The U.S. has the largest economy in the world, not just because we're such nice people, but because all technological innovation happens in the U.S. Also, one other thing, the U.S. is completely surrounded by oceans 
and Canada to the north and Mexico to the south. So the U.S. is not really threatened by any other country. You can't really invade the United States. So it's very hard. Uh, and so, so the U.S. is not only relatively and huge, safe. And we're huge consumers. We're huge consumers. So everybody likes the U.S. dollar to be strong because we're the ones who buy everything in every other country. And uh, uh, everybody wants our dollar. We're the safe currency. The only currency maybe safer than the U.S. dollar is Bitcoin. Now, that doesn't mean Bitcoin is, a, is you should buy it or sell it. The U.S. dollar is strong enough. Everybody wants the dollar. So the more people who want the dollar, that increases the demand when the supply is increased. We, our biggest issue as a country and as an economy is the deflation that happens when 40 million people simultaneously lose their jobs. So the solution, by the way, for the deflation is give people money. Give the bottom half of society, anybody who makes less than 100,000 a year, 50,000 a year, give them all $10,000. Don't give corporations any money at all. Just give each worker in the US, let's say there's, there's 100 million workers, give the bottom half of them, 50 million workers, $10,000 each. So what is that? That's um, uh, five, five uh, uh, I don't even know, $5 trillion. So no, yes, $5 trillion. So give, spend $5 trillion. Instead of spending $5 trillion bailing out Delta Airlines and Wells Fargo and AMC theaters and Carnival right. Cruise Lines, spend $5 trillion. Heck, you know what? I'm, even in, I'm not even fine with it. Do reparations. Do reparations for everybody who wants reparations. And then you will have enough money in the economy that there will no longer be deflation. There'll be enough demand that there's uh, uh, it'll keep inflation from going up too high and people will lend money to the U.S. And by the way, open the borders. Let immigrants come in, particularly if they're, I will say this, this is how, I don't care what anybody thinks, is, let people who have technology backgrounds and technology skills come in from whatever country they want because the U.S. grows on the back of technological innovation. I don't know if you agree with that completely. I don't. Well, you, you Not, look, look I, at I, every I, big... I just wouldn't do it. I mean, honestly, China is... We are in war with China. There's so? no way. No way. Look at, look at the biggest companies in the world. So Google... They want to divide and conquer us. Google, Sergey Brin was an immigrant from Russia. Uh, you know, all of these countries are run by immigrants from China, from India, from all these places that have... Uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, they have great technologists and they keep coming here. But once you start blocking them off, that could hurt the U.S. But, all right, we'll see. Who cares? Uh, and I want to actually make it clear, too, that, I mean, there are people, you know, most people in China don't, I mean, they're great people and they're good people. It's just, it's the government that is just untrustworthy, you know? So, it's not like I'm against the Chinese. Oh, so then let's let all, let's, let's take right, all that. But it's hard to, like, figure out how to, do that. I'll, I'll start you off. Let's just take everybody from Hong Kong and bring them in the U.S. Right. That would be great. And then let's have from any technical school, bring them in. Yeah, I don't know anyone that's from Hong Kong that wants to stay there now. It's really, really sad. Yeah, let's just, I, this is what I said last week. Let's just make Montana New Hong Kong. Let's change the name of Montana to New Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Let all the Hong Kong people in and they can go can be, get, be citizens automatically and boom. Well, the U.S. will be the and let's and like I said last week, let's bring all the Israelis into Wyoming, make that new make change Wyoming to New Israel. I'm sorry, person from Wyoming, and boom, this will be 50 years from now. The U.S. will be so far technologically advanced because we're kind of like people th third generation Americans. Okay, there are some good ones, there are some bad ones, but we're not the ones leading tech technology change. Yeah. You know what I mean? So again, the biggest companies in the world, I'll, I'll guarantee you, they were immigrants three generations ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Steve Jobs' dad, I think, was from Lebanon or Syria. Right. You know, his, his biological dad was uh, no, Islam. I mean, the United States is, is made from immigrants. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. All right, I will... Um, okay, someone asked about stocks. I will answer this question about stocks. If you were to invest an amount of money, say $100,000, picking large cap stocks, 
how confident am I on a scale of one through 10 that I would beat the market, that I would return better than the market? And I will say I'm a nine or a 10, I'm 10 being the best. The reason is, is because I won't pick any stocks myself. I will just pick whatever stocks Warren Buffett is buying. And I'll tell you what he's buying in a second. But if you just pick Warren Buffett's stocks, uh, you can't really go that wrong. And there was a study done. Somebody did a study. If you always pick the stocks that Warren Buffett picks, how well would you do? And on average, you would do 10% better a year than the market if you just pick all this, if you just piggyback everything Warren Buffett just bought. Mm -hmm. So he, Warren Buffett's been doing a lot of selling lately, by the way, but he did buy three new stocks this quarter. He bought uh, STOR, STNE, and PNC. And I even, this is how clueless I am. I even, I've even written about these and I've forgotten what they are. So STOR is a retail, it's a REIT, mm -hmm. um, and they, they have 9,000 tenants in all mm -hmm. uh, commercial spaces all around the country for stores that are not, and they've done all this analysis, these stores are not really closing down. I don't know. And they give like a four or 5% dividend. And then STNE, I totally forgot what that is. Uh, by the way, if you bought that Rap Technologies at any particular Wait. point, Wait. when I've recommended it in the past two months, you would have done very well. Um, STNE is, uh, oh yeah, this is the Square of Brazil. So Square, run by Jim McKelvey, hmm. uh, they allow mom and pop shops all around the country to accept credit cards. So Warren Buffett, he looked at the model of Square, he said, ah, let's see where other countries are doing yeah. it in. So he bought, you know, uh, whatever the name is, Stoneco, S-T-N-E, hmm. and uh, they're the Square of Brazil. Again, economy independent, M tens of millions of people need to accept credit cards, particularly yeah. now that cash is kind of going away, in part because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And PNC is uh, a, a, not a small bank, but it's a regional bank. Regional banks tend to be a little safer than the JP Morgans of the world. They also give a 5% dividend. So those are three stocks by Warren Buffett. I am not owners of any of them. I'm not necessarily recommending them, but those are the stocks I would buy if I was trying to just beat the stock market uh, and by piggybacking Warren Buffett. This is, by the way, this is an incredibly valuable advice. It's valuable to know that research has shown that piggybacking Warren Buffett will help you beat the market. It is possible to beat the market. Most of your returns in the stock market over the past 100 years come from dividends, and all three of these stocks give nice, significant dividends that are higher than what you get from treasury bills. And it's good to know that Warren Buffett's buying them. He's done his research. And by the way, if you were to sell them, I would sell them. Um, so let's see another question. Um, how do I deal with Twitter hate? Oh, you, sorry, uh, Real Tina, Real Talk Tina, you missed the stocks. He said they're specifically Stoneco, S-T-N-E, and that is the square of, uh, of Brazil. And then S-T-O-R is a retail, a, a REIT, sorry, a REIT, which gives a nice dividend. And PNC is a regional bank. And those are the three stocks. Uh, someone says one to 10, how bullish am I on Bitcoin now? I would say um, I'm always a 10 long-term. Right now I'm about a five, but I think if there's ever a question about the US dollar, Bitcoin is gonna skyrocket. I think everybody is looking at Bitcoin right now. All the smart money is looking at Bitcoin and saying, thank God Bitcoin exists. Mm -hmm. I am not in Bitcoin yet, is what they're saying. But if it didn't exist, I'd be scared. But Bitcoin is a good, safe place to put money if the dollar starts to flounder. Because where are you gonna put money? What other currency are you gonna put money in? You're gonna put it in gold? How are you gonna buy gold? You still have to go through a US broker, whereas Bitcoin is spread out all over the world. How about Ethereum? No, I'm not looking at the use cases of Bitcoin or Ethereum. I'm just looking at Bitcoin as a safe, a flight to safety for people who are scared about the US dollar. So. Um, so like I said, I'm glad Bitcoin exists. By the way, I myself personally am moving some of my other cryptos into Bitcoin, but for now, uh, on a scale of zero to 10, I have it as a five. Z I like Zcash, but I might even move my Zcash to Bitcoin just because I think uh, Bitcoin might be a little safer. These are not recommendations, I'm just saying what I'm doing. Um, it's different for everybody. Uh, Oh, uh, 
Let me see if there's any other questions. Somebody asked me also last week, uh, they don't want, so I've given a bunch of 30 day book challenges and let me know if you want me to summarize those in a, in a future uh, one of these lives. But somebody asked, a, a, a lot of those um, 30 day book challenges involved a tiny bit of research. And this person asked, what if she doesn't want to do any research? Uh, the answer is, don't worry about it. Here's what I would do. What's a good reason for writing a book? A good reason for writing a book, and this, this has never occurred before in history, but you can write a book now and upload it to Amazon. You'll have no customers, but maybe if only one group of people are your customers, it's worth it. And that's your great, great, great grandchildren. Like I wish, I wish I could look back at my great grandmother or my grandfather or my great great grandfather who came to the US and I wish I could read a story. Like I know I have one great great grandparent and you probably have similar where in order to get into the US, she was a three year old, she hid in a trunk mm -hmm. on the entire boat and, and her parents just carried the trunk into the country. I don't know why they had to do it, but you know what, I'd like to know why they yeah, had to do it. I wish they had written a memoir. I know. So, and when you write a memoir, this is a key thing to remember. It's not just a list of facts. It's not just like on January 8th, 1900, I was born. On January 15th, I graduated. On January 30th, I did this. No, talk about how you felt each step of the way. Anyone who's lived in the past century has had problems. Start off with your problems. Like, oh, you were, you, you grew up in the Great Depression. What did your parents have to do to make a living? What was the worst thing you saw in the Depression? What was the most horrible example of poverty that you either experienced or witnessed? How did you get through World War II? What, what, were you scared? Like, people are scared right now. If you're writing a memoir right now, you wouldn't just say, oh, you wouldn't just list dates. March 16th, we were locked down. We stayed home. We ordered delivery. March, you know, June 1st, we decided to stay locked down. You wouldn't just list dates, you would say, oh, I got scared. They were restricting us more and more. I was worried the virus was gonna kill my old grandmother or my friends. And then I was worried when there was peaceful protests and then there was rioters and then there was the jazz. Uh, I got scared and this is why I got scared. Tell stories. A, a memoir, take the points in your life that were most painful and, and tell the story how you got through it. Like, the arc of the hero is Think of Luke Skywalker. He wanted something, but he, just, he couldn't get it. So he was frustrated, he had a problem. And then something happened that was devastating. In Luke Skywalker's case, his parents were killed by Imperial stormtroopers. And then he meets this weird old guy. He meets this weird old homeless guy, Ben Kenobi. And Ben Kenobi's like, oh man, Luke, your, your daddy is the, the, the ruler of the universe. Let's go find him. And they go off and they on an adventure and they meet more and more friends and it's really scary. And he's scared all the time. And then he meets Princess Leia and he escapes the Death Star and blah, blah. They, more and more things happen. So tell the arc of the story and about each section of your life. Okay, and if you, if you don't wanna do it, just say it into a recorder transcribe it, hand it to an editor, they'll edit it into nice language, and then you up, find a cover and you upload it to Amazon. It's very simple to write a basic memoir. You might not sell billions of copies, but I can guarantee you, your great, great grandchildren mm -hmm. will want to read it. It's the only way they're gonna hear your very unique, very special voice, and it's important to them because your story is their history. So. Good, that's a good idea. I mean, imagine like you have, uh, family here from the 1600s. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you like to know how they got here on yeah. Plymouth Rock or whatever? <laughs> Are you a daughter of the Mayflower? Were they on the Mayflower? No. Mm -mm. But you're a daughter of the American Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want to hear their story? Do you know any of their stories? I'm, I'm learning their stories. I'm researching it. What's like one of their stories? I, I don't have one that I can tell you really right now. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to talk as quiet as you, and then nobody can hear us <laughs> ever. But we have a lot of questions, though. People are wanting some questions. All right, let's see more questions. Um, so there's somebody, oh, and it's a regular here. I'm sorry to hear this. I, uh, well, or maybe. Um, 
uh, walked out of an unhealthy job situation, got a new job that has a bison ranch attached to it. I quit this past mm -hmm. Friday. Could you talk about changing jobs during the pandemic? Wait, he has a bison ranch? Yes. He wants... In a new job. He's got a bison ranch attached to his new job. So I don't know what his oh. new job is. Uh, maybe it's, uh, he works at a bison. restaurant for buffalo, serving buffalo yeah, because, sandwiches. Uh, bison, like you can really do something with their milk. I mean, if, like they have yogurt. But bison's yeah. buffalo, right? Yeah. What's the difference between a buffalo and a cow? I'm an idiot. Well, one's a buffalo and one's a cow. Are they completely different animals? Yes. Is a buffalo a kind of cow? Is a buffalo like no. a bull? Anybody? No. It is a bull, but it's not that species. It's a different species. So, someone has a bison ranch attached to his new job. I don't know what's that, why that's related to the job. But in general, when you get a new job, here's what I always recommend. Do several things. First off, very important, over-promise and over-deliver. Uh, so, okay, Chris... It's organical bison. What's the, what's the job? What's, is it a restaurant or are you doing something with the bison? But I will give you some suggestions. So in general, always, oh, so you're a meat cutter. That's great. So you know what I would do? I would see, and this is related to new businesses that people could start. And you can maybe even do this on the side with a new job. Um, I would set up a meal delivery service. So right now, people are afraid to go to the grocery store. People are afraid to have delivery. Uh, not everybody, but some. And I think right now, the, a big boom is meal prep, meal delivery. You could deliver to schools, you could deliver to households. Uh, you could charge, uh, you know, $10 a meal, but make it for like a dollar a meal. So meal delivery services are great. And could you imagine um, doing meal delivery or doing food delivery, you know, Get enough bison, bring it home, set up a regulated kitchen, and sell and have have a menu that's just bison, right. and you know bison Organic. sandwiches, bison sandwiches with coleslaw on it, mm -hmm. bison sandwiches with pineapple on it. You know, disgusting. But you could sell whatever you want. It's really good, actually. Bison's great. Milk. Yeah. Buffalo. Uh, so, and you tan. So here's what I would do. In general, when you're starting a new job. Over promise and over deliver. Someone says, well, don't you mean under promise and under deliver? I, and and over, under promise and over deliver? No, over, always over promise. If they say, can you make two of these? Offer to do four and then deliver six. And everybody else in the world is under promising and, and trying to over deliver. Sometimes they succeed and sometimes fail. If you're the only person at your new job who's over promising and over delivering, you will shine. So my very first corporate job, I would, some weekends I would stay there and I would just put in that little extra effort that would show that I'm over delivering and I rose up so fast, it was ridiculous. So uh, always over promise and over deliver. Second thing is always give your credit, always give your boss all the credit. So if people say to you, hey man, you did a really great job. Oh, say it's all thanks to my boss. Give your boss as much credit as possible. Or, or give your coworkers credit. Hey, this was a team effort. Give, you know, Rob, Janet, uh, Sylvia, whatever. Give them as much credit as possible. You wanna be a credit machine. People are attracted. You become the magnet. People are attracted to the people who give out credit freely because you're not hoarding it. And then they know that you're the generous person. That will build your career forever and ever and ever. The other thing is get to know all the secretaries at your work. So take them out to lunch, have phone calls with them, get to know them, get to know all the secretaries. The secretaries are the key to running all the executive schedules. Um, no, I was gonna say, uh, he could do like a, like a uh, organic buffalo uh, like tour or something, or have kids like a camp where they can actually help, you know. If they allow people into the ranch. Right, but maybe they can, start something like that because uh, you know teaching kids about you know organic uh, farming and and meats and you know also I've never seen uh, an organic bison or even a bison cookbook make a bison cookbook really just for yeah. buffalo meat yeah oh mm -hmm. I've never seen one and you could write all that stuff in That's the right. cookbook 
And that would be interesting. So again, spoken wheel, your new job, even a job is a wheel and it has many spokes from it. So when I was working at HBO, you would think I was an employee and yet I built a website. So I started building websites for other companies. I was making, working on a TV show. So I started working on other ideas for TV shows. I, I turned everything I was doing into the spoken wheel approach. I was used, just starting to use the internet. So I wrote a, a book proposal, which never got published, for a book about the internet. This was in 1995. So everything you're doing, think about what's all the things that branch out of that. Cookbook, camp, delivery service. Uh, 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 cheese making, organic cheese. Organic cheese, buffalo, buffalo cheese. Yeah. Buffalo milkshakes, Yeah. whatever. Okay. So, uh, yogurt, yogurt, buffalo yogurt is actually very, very good and very popular. Good? Mm -hmm. Where is it popular? Everywhere. Yeah. Here? But you don't eat yogurt, so you wouldn't know. I don't eat yogurt. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, okay, what's your recommended way to value an online app? If I funded the development myself, and now I wanna take on an investor to help? Great question. So if you've never, so basically, the, the, this is similar to the question, if you've just started a business, or you created software to just start a business, and now, now an investor wants to come on, how do you value the app? First thing is, do you really need an investor? Maybe you need an investor because you wanna quit your job and you work on it. Maybe you need an investor because you want a software developer, but I see you created the app, so maybe you don't need a developer. Here's what I would recommend. Before you get an investor, get users. Very important for an investor is to know that there are users who love your app and who are willing to give a testimonial on it. Now let's say your app is free and you, you don't quite have a business model yet. You know, still get as many users as possible. If you have 5,000 users, if you even have 100 users, that's better than having zero users. It shows that 100 people are using your app on a regular basis so the investor could say, oh, this is gonna be good. If you have no users, do not raise money because there's no way to value your business. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I'll tell you, I am funding, I am self-funding a business right now and I don't think I will take on an investor until I have about 100,000 users. And, when, or if you're making money. So if you're doing like, for instance, hypothetically, the coronavirus compliance business and that and you have three corporations who have signed up for your coronavirus compliance business and they're subscribing to your crates of gloves and masks and disinfectants that's good too uh, you know if you're on track to make you know a good hundred thousand a year from your customers now maybe you could raise you know half a million dollars at a two million dollar valuation or or if you have a hundred thousand customers for an app Okay, raise a million dollars at a three or a four million dollar valuation. If you don't know what those terms mean, let me know and I can give a, give a little bit more course on what I mean in terms of funding. But you're, you're, you're basically, you're, uh, an app with no customers is worth nothing. An app with a thousand or 10,000 customers might be worth between two and three million for fundraising purposes. Or a, a, a business to business service like coronavirus compliance you need some customers, and you need to show that the business can survive without you. That means there has to be some subscription. And then you usually value it at about one times, I don't know, one times what your potential revenues could be in the first year. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, hello, James and the beautiful Robin. I don't even know where the question is, but I just wanted to say that part. That's what this person says. Watch out, celeb crusher. Oh, female. Um, <laughs> since you are the only other person I know who doesn't use a to-do list, please help me tell, let me know how you keep your writings organized. It's a good question. So for instance, when I write down stand-up comedy, I write myself a draft email and I'll send myself an email and the subject line is always jokes XXX. <laughs> so then if I ever want to see what are my latest thoughts on jokes, I type in jokes XXX. Mm -hmm. When I was writing my book, Skip the Line, any idea or any, um, uh, writing I did for skip the line, I would just send myself an email and the subject would be skip the line or skip the line X. I have to have some way to identify it. So I just always am constantly sending myself email for different categories of writing. That's all you have to do because then your Gmail becomes like this giant database of ideas. 
I've been using Gmail since 2005 or 2006. So I've got tens of thousands, I've got, I've got three, let me see. I've got 321,182 unread emails in my inbox and 543,465 emails total in my inbox. And that doesn't include spam or anything else. So, um, okay, someone asked a good question here. Why is your next book, so my next book's called Skip the Line. It's actually on, on, available for pre-order right now on Amazon. You don't have to pre-order it though. It's coming out March 23rd. Why is your next book, did I, am I not using self-publishing? So I always recommend self-publishing. I've been self, I, I published in, in the first part of my writing career, I've used many mainstream publishers. I use Wiley, HarperCollins, Penguin, Hay House, uh, maybe some others, I forget. And then I self-published my biggest book ever, which sold over a million copies, Choose Yourself. I self-published that. The reason I self-published that was because I could release it right away. Like now I have to wait till March 23rd, 2021. I could release, I released Choose Yourself two weeks after I finished it. And I was completely in charge of pricing, marketing, business deals. I did business deals. I'll tell you one business deal I did. So in, in, I published the book on like June 3rd, 2013. In August of 2013, I did a business deal, a marketing deal for Choose Yourself. I, I said, I'll sell the Kindle version, the ebook of Choose Yourself for $30. And I wrote like five new chapters and I piggybacked it on someone else's email list Oh, sorry, $20. Piggyback, like someone sent it to their 2 million person email list and they recommended it. They said, get this guy's book and his five free chapters and it's only cost $20. The Kindle was selling on Amazon for 99 cents and I didn't even have to change the price because I wrote these extra chapters. And then this guy split 50-50 with me. Within two weeks, he sold out uh, 20,000 books for $20. I got a check for $200,000 because I was able to make my own marketing deals and that's, the benefit, that's such a great benefit, one of the many benefits of self-publishing. So you ask a question, why am I using a mainstream publisher? Well, it's good to just not do the same thing all the time. This is my, this is my 25th book and you know, for about 13 or 14 of them I've self-published, for maybe 10 or 11 of them I published mainstream this I, I got it with this book. I'm working with an editor that I worked with ten years ago, and I really like her and think she's smart. So I want I wanted this to be by far my best book ever. Like I put so much into it. I wanted to make sure I had an editor I really trusted. So I knew this woman Hollis at Harper Collins is the best editor I've ever had. I wanted to work with her. We've been talking for ten years about working together again. You know I don't know what will happen. Like I the one problem of Publishing is you kind of have to do all your own marketing. So I know I'm gonna to have to do all my own marketing But I already saw she did such a great job on the editing. We did four or five revisions back and forth There's gonna be another revision with proofreaders They'll help a little bit with marketing. I have a call scheduled after this about marketing actually on that book They arranged the call so uh, Speaking of which tomorrow I will do another 30-day book challenge and I'll summarize the other 30 day book challenges and I really want people to take it seriously. You can and should write a book and I'll give you the complete business model for book writing, newsletter writing, and then what you do next after your first book and how to market it and so on. Plus some more business ideas, plus questions. Ask questions to 203-590-8607. Can ask anything you want about parenting, business ideas, creativity, writing, Coronavirus, don't forget the good news of the day is that the daily new deaths in the US is at its lowest point since March 23rd. Congratulations, we're, we're the greatest generation now. Screw all those World War II people. This is the generation that survived 9-11, that survived the boomers, that survived the Great Recession, now survived coronavirus, it's gonna yeah. survive the bubonic plague next, yeah. and, and, all the, and this, we're gonna survive this presidential election, God willing. <laughs> See you tomorrow and I'll store this whole uh, feed on, on Instagram and later on.